Hello, I am Dave Ortega with Somerville Media Center, and I'm happy to be once again joined with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Uh, welcome to you, Julia. Thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, we've been doing these uh, bi-weekly uh, roundups between uh, Somerville Media Center and Somerville Journal. Um, and let's, let's just start off here with uh, an update on some COVID statistics um, and other related uh, COVID news. Awesome. Yeah. So I wanted to start with this because um, I think like many people with so much other news going on, um, it's important to remember that we are still in a pandemic, <laughs> yes. um, that that is still happening. Um, and that while Massachusetts has been doing a relatively good job of, or at least we're seeing a relatively steady kind of decline in the number of new cases per day, that that is not the case all around this country. Um, so that there is still definitely a risk. Um, but here in Somerville, um, cases definitely have started to level off. Um, so there are some increasing, um, but at this point, um, 980 people have been tested positive, um, 881 have recovered, and there have been 31 confirmed fatalities um, in the city. Um, so that is just, you know, something to remember and keep up to date on that, like, the city is still sending out updates on this about every week. Um, and there is still a lot of public health information that is coming out about how we should be kind of evolving our management of this. Um, so for example, just recently, the city released some more guidelines on how we're going to navigate this pandemic summer. Woo. <laughs> so they released some guidelines for pools. Um, there are going to be pools that are reopening with certain guidelines in place, splash pads, playgrounds, et cetera. Um, but they also released some updated guidelines for face coverings um, because as I'm sure most people experience, I know I do, um, it can be kind of hard to wear a face mask, especially when it's really, really humid as it can get <laughs> in our New England summers. Um, so essentially, um, the, the, you know, the mask ordinance still applies. It's still important that when you're outside um, and you know, not able to socially distance, especially that you have a face covering on. Um, but essentially, like when you're outside, and you are able to socially distance at least six feet away from others. The city has said that you are able to remove your face covering, um, but you must put it on when others are nearby. And the, the specifics of it is that they say like, um, if you are like taking your mask off, definitely still carry it with you. And then if you're like going for a walk, for example, and you have your mask off, when you see someone about 30 feet away, which they say is like the length of a bus, you should put it back on. They should put it back on so that you are covered by the time that you are passing each other. Um, but it's, you know, it's just meant to pe to like just help people navigate, you know, tough, humid, hot summers, having something like over your mouth <laughs> where, where you need to breathe. Yeah. Um, so all of this is up on the city website. We've posted it on our website as well, just to make sure it gets out there. Um, but the kind of caveat to a lot of the information that's going out, um, just recently they released some guidance on schools reopening in September, which we'll be hearing more about in the next week, um, is that any of this could change at pretty much any moment if the public health landscape changes. So while this might be good news, yay, like you don't have to be quite as like stringent about wearing a face mask in summer. If, if for some reason the numbers get worse, we all have to remember that we're still very much managing this and that numbers change, trends change, and public health guidance can change really, really quickly. Um, so it's just something to remember, even as the reopening phases continue, even as I think indoor dining just started, though a lot of places in Somerville have actually chosen not to start up indoor dining. They're still using outdoor dining. If you've walked down Davis, they've actually, in Davis Square, they've closed down part of Elm Street, so it's only one lane. The burn is open again. They've got some tables outside. It's a very different picture of our squares. Um, but even, you know, even as you remember this, keep your servers in mind when you're eating out. You know, they're putting themselves at risk for you. Um, just continue to kind of have compassion and mindfulness around um, that we're still all managing this together. Right. Um, but yeah, there's a little update on that. And uh, just to circle back on on what we were talking about with face coverings, yeah, um, it is face coverings are still required uh, in any indoor space. Yes. Um, and then there are some exceptions for children under the age two and people with certain disabilities. But um, yes, to go to the city's website for all those for all mm -hmm. those uh, guidelines. 
Um, and then you mentioned uh, some of the pools and splash pads. Those are scheduled to reopen on July 1st. Um, the um, tr- some of them were a little sooner and some of them were July 1st. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, going by the the last city update, the two pools are operated by the city, the Kennedy School Pool at 5 Cherry Street and the Outdoor Dillboy Pool. Um, they're scheduled to open July 1st with uh, obviously safety protocols. Um, uh, including decreased occupancy and staggered hours for extra cleaning. Um, so anybody interested in that should go to SomervilleRec.com for all those rules to know beforehand what to expect. And then playgrounds are scheduled to open June 29th, which uh, as we're recording this on the 25th, that's just in a couple of days. Um, so playgrounds reopening and basketball hoops will be unblocked on June 29th. Yeah. But again, like if you read, if you read through the restrictions, the city explicitly said that like if, if, you know, people drive by and people are not wearing face coverings or they're not adequately social distancing, they will be reblocking the courts and closing things down if people aren't able to use them safely. So something to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that update, Julia. Um, and then moving on to a topic that's been on a lot of people's minds, uh, the budget. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, like said, we're, we're taping this on the 25th. And uh, last night, there, there was a hearing. Uh, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Sure. Yeah. So this, um, just to kind of start off, this has definitely been an unusual budget season. Um, many cities and towns are navigating a pretty complicated, um, you know, revenue uh, changes. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly decreases um, because because of um, the impact of the coronavirus on our economy. Um, so unlike most years when the city council usually receives a budget from the administration at the beginning of June, the city council only received a budget for consideration, an annual budget, on June 19th, which was a Friday. Um, so this budget deliberations only began this week. Um, and even though it is the recommendation of the city for the city council to pass an annual full 12 month budget, which is what is typically done, um, I do believe it is not the intention of the finance committee chair and the city council to do so. Um, the city is it, preparing a, what's called a continuing appropriation or a one twelfth budget, um, which I believe the chair and the council anticipate. This is all, you know, things could change. They anticipate passing on the 30th, um, the last day of June, and they, they need to pass something by the 30th because the new fiscal year starts on July 1st. And if there's no budget that has been approved by then, then city services stop. Um, so that's just a little picture of kind of where we're at. Um, but yes, um, usually in the budget process, um, a public hearing is held at the end, but it was this council's intention to hold a public hearing at the beginning of the process so they could go into the budget process with the public's feedback in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a shift. It's all at the end of June still, but it was nearing the beginning of the, the budget process. Um, so last night, um, or on, the, on June 24th, um, was a very long night for the city council. Uh, the public hearing started at 6 p.m. and public testimony continued until just past midnight. So over six hours of public testimony. And it wasn't the full council. It was the committee of the whole. Uh, yes, which what is you, it's, it, is, it is the finance committee of the whole, which is usually the full council. I believe the full council was in attendance. Okay. Um, but yes, correct. That is correct terminology. Um, so I believe according to um, the finance committee chair, JT Scott, um, 151 people shared testimony. Um, and many others submitted public comment uh, via email online. Um, But it was a a long night. I myself listened to about two and a half, three hours of it. Um, And I will say that um, from, you know, my own attendance and from following up on Twitter and following up with the counselors, um, the vast majority of public testimony was offered, that was offered was about the police budget. Um, And that was an organized effort. Yes. So that, exactly, that was, it's an important thing to acknowledge that uh, there's recently kind of an organization or kind of like an activist um, group that has sprung up called Defund SPD. Um, And yes, they have organized to get a lot of people to sign a petition um, asking for the reallocation of funds away from the Somerville Police Department and into other city services like education, the housing, Office of Housing Stability, et cetera. 
Um, but yes, um, if you listen through the testimony, most people who testified um, shared, you know, their own personalized testimony, but then one consistent uh, demand, which was the de demand of this organization, which was to defund the SPD by 60% and for the city council to not approve a budget that did not cut the budget, the police budget by at least 10%. So they said, we want 60%. But we demand at least ten percent cut to the police budget, yeah. um, and that was pretty consistent, which is consistent absolutely the result of that organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was it was a long night. Um, the council did commit to taking um, anyone who was willing to self identify as Black, Indigenous, or a person of color um, were taken first to offer testimony. Um, but I think, you know, some people, some people didn't self-identify, but even, even then it, it just, it went very long and people only had two minutes to speak and many didn't use their whole two minutes. They yielded their time after they, you know, shared what they had to say. Um, but it was, it was really something. I, I, I do believe that um, 151 people testified. I believe three of those people, according to JT Scott, testified against defunding the SPD. Um, and I think there were one or two. Um, I heard one when I was listening who testified on a topic separate um, from that one. The person I heard was testifying in regard to transportation funding in the budget, for example. Um, but it, the hearing was pretty much stacked and taken over by, by those people. Um, it, it ran about five hours uh, from what I over saw. six hours. Six hours? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I know. Um, so but that is... Um, so that's the, just the public hearing, but now there is still, there's still more budget review left. So as you said, we're recording this on the 25th, um, on the 29th, which is on Monday, June 29th, the city council will be reviewing the police department budget, which means that the police chief will be, will come before the city council for them to ask questions about budgetary line items um, and inquire as to what's being used, what's not being used, um, and the department head usually has to justify why that funding is being um, placed there, asked for, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I think is important to talk about with this whole process, and I actually wrote a column about it because I was getting a lot of questions, um, is the actual power of the city council when it comes to making change. Um, do they have any power? I guess the question is, do they have any power? Exactly. What makes a business? Exactly. Business? Um, hang on, stuff. sorry. Um, so yes, so really, um, they they don't have much power. That's kind of the, the reality of it because Somerville has a strong mayor government. Um, so the city council, their power in the budget process is that they can make cuts. So usually what happens and what is probably going to happen in this process is they go through the whole process. They talk to every department head and they go through it and they go through it. And then they have like a, what they call cut night um, where they just all propose cuts on cuts on cuts on cuts on cuts on cuts. On cuts. <laughs> it's a, usually they consider it like, you know, this like brutal night. Right. Um, so Really, though, the, the city council does not have the power to reallocate funds like many of the residents are requesting they do. So what happens is after the funds are cut, um, and they only have the power to cut line items in the budget. Um, so within a department, the mayor and the executive office actually has the power to move funds around, not between departments, but within a department, if that makes sense. Um, so. Afterwards, the money that's cut, it can go into discretionary funds. It can go into just like, you know, this other general pot of money that is just kind of there and it has to be reallocated and has to come before the city council. Usually if it wants to go into a different department, it's a very convoluted and complicated process. Hmm. Um, but the most important thing I think for people to remember is that the city council itself cannot just take $500,000 from the police department and put it into the Office of Housing Stability. That is not a power they possess. The only way that that can happen is if they cut that money and it goes into, you know, this kind of ether or this fund and the mayor 
says, I want to take this and put it into the Office of Housing Stability and not would have to come before the city council for approval. But the executive office is the only one who can make that change. So that's something important to kind of remember in this process. Um, that of course it's important to speak up and be heard, but a lot of this, it, it's the city council and the mayor working in coalition that will get this done. It is not just one. That makes sense. It sounds, it sounds complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, as with any, any budget year it, or, uh, any, any sort of budget process, it's complicated and it's further further complicated uh, with with the issues that we've seen come to light uh, and the the scrutiny that uh, people are placing uh, police budgets yeah. under um, which which is worth worth taking a look at yeah. um, so that is a is a good segue for us to move on to uh, the city conversations uh, that they are initiating about uh, policing and systemic racism um, we yes. have we have an event uh, coming up on uh, June twenty seventh at ten thirty, mm -hmm. where uh, the mayor will be joined by the Cambridge mayor and the Somerville police chief um, to uh, speak to race and equity in policing. Mm -hmm. um, so what else? What else is the city doing? Um, we know we had uh, the mayor declare racism a public health emergency. If, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, is this part of that initiative? Um, do you know what else, what else he has uh, planned as, as far as this uh, public health crisis that, sure. that the city has declared? Right. I, I think that's hard to say. Um, the announcement of, you know, his declaration of racism as a public health and safety emergency, um, that was accompanied by kind of a, a list of specific actions that the city had was committed to taking. Mm -hmm. um, it involved, um, you know, advocating for body cams, advocating for a civilian review or committing to establish, you know, a civilian review process for police action. Um, there, there are a number, a number of actions. Um, so that was kind of, that kind of announcement was in conjunction with those actions. And then since then, I think the city has been just like, for example, um, on Tuesday, the 23rd, the city hosted a panel on structural racism, um, which included uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, um, Suffolk DA Rachel Rollins, um, Framingham Mayor Yvonne Spicer, our own uh, Councilor Willem Baugh, the school committee member Andre Green. Um, so, you know, a panel of, um, of uh, you know, people of color, mostly um, Black people in leadership, um, to kind of have a conversation around structural racism, not just in Somerville, but kind of nationwide, but in, in you know, in our communities. Um, so I think there's, you know, a, there's been a bit more of that, trying to kind of engage the city in conversation around that. So I think the event on Saturday that you mentioned has to do with that. Um, I do believe the city uh, and the mayor specifically has also posted about holding um, small group listening sessions, which you can sign up for, and I think groups of 10 or less. Um, for with the mayor to talk about these issues, um, and I will say that um, you know there there has been some um, some kind of discussion of how the mayor may not have necessarily spoken with like Somerville people of color when he was developing his initial kind of like declaration of the emergency. Um, but since since then, you know, from you know from the way he's been speaking about this and from how other people have been speaking about this, he has said that his mission is to listen. That at this point, his mission is to listen and to, you know, step up to make sure that this action is happening, but to also step back and to make sure that people of color are leading this. Um, so I think, you know, it seems that, you know, holding small group listening sessions like that is in line with that goal to kind of hear more from the community um, about what they want and who they want to drive this. Um, I think it's also important to mention it's 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 related to the budget because it was included in, his, in the mayor's budget presentation. But the mayor has also um, committed to funding, subject to city council approval, um, a new racial and social justice project, which would include hiring a director of racial and social justice um, to oversee a lot of these initiatives and community process. 
um, which kind of according to him is is that to to get you know a leader of color in this position to lead these conversations and lead the direction of this change in the city. Um, there's also as part of the initiative, there's also a fund um, to support black and brown and minority owned businesses. Um, and ventures, et cetera. There's a couple aspects to it, um, but there are a number of actions it seems that the city is taking um, in regard to that. Um, I will say though that there, you know, there's a new organization. We spoke about this in our last update, Just Us Somerville, who's actually already hosted several events, uh, rallies, candlelight vigils, et cetera. Um, and they have released their own list of demands, suggestions, their own platform, if you will. Um, which includes civilian review. It includes removing the um, STEPS program, the cadet program, which the city has committed to removing from the schools um, and a couple of other steps as well. Um, but one of the, the first demand that they had on their list is to end the co-option of black and brown narratives and to like include and invite POC people to drive these decisions. Um, and I, I recently wrote a story about that and, and asked the mayor like what that really meant to him. And that's when he was kind of speaking about being, you know, being a listener. Um, but I think that's really what communities of color in Somerville are wanting at the moment. They're saying, okay, like we're happy things are happening, but we need to be in charge. You know, we need to be at the table. We need to be leading the charge. You know what I mean? Um, and that, you know, because of, you know, because of structural racism, because of how, you know, our power structures are built, there aren't necessarily a lot of POC in leadership and in power in the city. Um, so I think the task that the city seems to be setting out to do is to try to get them there and to involve their voices. Um, but I expect it will be a process. More to come with that. And I'm excited to see where, where that goes. Um, well, thank you, Julia, once again for another another packed news roundup. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Gosh. Um, and uh, if anybody is curious about any of these things that we're talking about, I invite you to go to the Somerville Journal's website, which is? Somerville.wickedlocal.com. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, Julia. Of course, thank you. <laughs>